This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter. A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. Book One, Chapter Five The Wine Shop. A large cask of wine had been dropped and broken in the street. The accident had happened in getting it out of a cart. The cask had tumbled out with a run, the hoops had burst, and it lay on the stones just outside the door of the wine-shop, shattered like a walnut-shell. All the people within reach had suspended their business or their idleness to run to the spot and drink the wine. The rough, irregular stones of the street, pointing every way, and designed, one might have thought, expressly to lame all living creatures that approached them, had dammed it into little pools. These were surrounded, each by its own jostling group or crowd, according to its size. Some men knelt down, made scoops of their two hands joined, and sipped, or tried to help women who bent over their shoulders to sip, before the wine had all run out between their fingers. Others, men and women, dipped in the puddles with little mugs of mutilated earthenware, or even with handkerchiefs from women's heads, which were squeezed dry into infants' mouths. Others made small mud embankments to stem the wine as it ran. Others, directed by lookers-on up at high windows, darted here and there to cut off little streams of wine that started away in new directions. Others devoted themselves to the sodden and lee-dyed pieces of the cask, licking and even champing the moister wine-rotted fragments with eager relish. There was no drainage to carry off the wine, and not only did it all get taken up, but so much mud got taken up along with it, that there might have been a scavenger in the street, if anyone acquainted with it could have believed in such a miraculous presence. A shrill sound of laughter, and of amused voices, voices of men, women, and children, resounded in the street while this wine-game lasted. There was little roughness in it, in the sport, and much playfulness. There was a special companionship in it, an observable inclination on the part of every one to join some other one, which led, especially among the luckier or lighter-hearted, to frolicsome embraces, drinking of healths, shaking of hands, and even joining of hands, and dancing a dozen together. When the wine was gone, and the places where it had been most abundant were raked into a gridiron pattern by fingers, these demonstrations ceased as suddenly as they had broken out. The man who had left his saw sticking in the firewood he was cutting set it in motion again. The woman who had left on a doorstep the little pot of hot ashes, at which she had been trying to soften the pain in her own starved fingers and toes, or those of her child, returned to it. Men with bare arms, matted locks, and cadaverous faces, who had emerged into the winter light from cellars, moved away to descend again and a gloom gathered on the scene that appeared more natural to it than sunshine. The wine was red wine, and had stained the ground of the narrow street in the suburb of Saint-Antoine in Paris, where it was spilled. It had stained many hands, too, and many faces, and many naked feet, and many wooden shoes. The hands of the man who sawed the wood left red marks on the billets, and the forehead of the woman who nursed her baby was stained with the stain of the old rag she wound about her head again. Those who had been greedy with the staves of the cask had acquired a tigerish smear about the mouth, and one tall joker so besmirched, his head more out of a long squalid bag of a nightcap than in it, scrawled upon a wall with his finger dipped in muddy wine lees. Blood! The time was to come when that wine, too, would be spilt on the street-stones, and when the stain of it would be red upon many there. And now that the cloud had settled on St. Antoine, which a momentary gleam had driven from his sacred countenance, the darkness of it was heavy. Cold, dirt, sickness, ignorance, and want were the lords in waiting on the saintly presence, nobles of great power, all of them but most especially the last. Samples of a people that had undergone a terrible grinding and re-grinding in the mill, and certainly not in the fabulous mill which ground old people young, shivered at every corner, passed in and out of every doorway, looked from every window, fluttered in every vestige of a garment that the wind shook, the mill which had worked them down 
was the mill that grinds young people old. The children had ancient faces and grave voices, and upon them, and upon the grown faces, and ploughed into every furrow of age and coming up afresh, was the sign, Hunger. It was prevalent everywhere. Hunger was pushed out of the tall houses, in the wretched clothing that hung upon poles and lines. Hunger was patched into them with straw and rag and wood and paper. Hunger was repeated in every fragment of the small modicum of firewood that the man sawed off. Hunger stared down from the smokeless chimneys, and started up from the filthy street that had no offal among its refuse of anything to eat. Hunger was the inscription on the baker's shelves, written in every small loaf of his scanty stock of bad bread, at the sausage shop, in every dead dog preparation that was offered for sale. Hunger rattled its dry bones among the roasting chestnuts in the turned cylinder. Hunger was shred into atomies in every farthing porringer of husky chips of potato, fried with some reluctant drops of oil. Its abiding place was in all things fitted to it, a narrow winding street full of offence and stench, with other narrow winding streets diverging, all peopled by rags and nightcaps, and all smelling of rags and nightcaps, and all visible things with a brooding look upon them that looked ill. In the hunted air of the people there was yet some wild beast thought of the possibility of turning at bay. Depressed and slinking though they were, eyes of fire were not wanting among them, nor compressed lips, white with what they suppressed, nor foreheads knitted into the likeness of the gallows-rope they mused about enduring, or inflicting. The trade signs, and they were almost as many as the shops, were all grim illustrations of want. The butcher and the porkman painted up only the leanest scrags of meat, the baker the coarsest of meagre loaves, the people rudely pictured as drinking in the wine-shops, croaked over their scanty measures of thin wine and beer, and were gloweringly confidential together. Nothing was represented in a flourishing condition, save tools and weapons. But the cutler's knives and axes were sharp and bright, the smith's hammers were heavy, and the gunmaker's stock was murderous. The crippling stones of the pavement, with their many little reservoirs of mud and water, had no footways, but broke off abruptly at the doors. The kennel, to make amends, ran down the middle of the street, when it ran at all, which was only after heavy rains, and then it ran, by many eccentric fits, into the houses. Across the streets at wide intervals, one clumsy lamp was slung by a rope and pulley. At night, when the lamplighter had let these down, and lighted and hoisted them again, a feeble grove of dim wicks swung in a sickly manner overhead, as if they were at sea. Indeed they were at sea, and the ship and the crew were in peril of tempest. For the time was to come, when the gaunt scarecrows of that region should have watched the lamplighter in their idleness and hunger, so long as to conceive the idea of improving on his method, and hauling up men by those ropes and pulleys, to flare upon the darkness of their condition. But the time was not come yet, and every wind that blew over France shook the rags of the scarecrows in vain, for the birds, fine of song and feather, took no warning. The wine-shop was a corner-shop, better than most others in its appearance and degree, and the master of the wine-shop had stood outside it in a yellow waistcoat and green breeches, looking on at the struggle for the lost wine. "'It's not my affair,' said he, with a final shrug of the shoulders. "'The people from the market did it. Let them bring another.' There his eyes happened to catch the tall joker writing up his joke, so he called to him across the way. "'Say then, my Gaspard, what do you do there?' The fellow pointed to his joke with immense significance, as is often the way with his tribe. It missed its mark, and completely failed, as is often the way with his tribe too. "'What now? Are you a subject for the mad hospital?' said the wine-shopkeeper, crossing the road and obliterating the jest with a handful of mud, picked up for the purpose, and smeared over it. "'Why do you write in the public streets? Is there, tell me thou, is there no other place to write such words in?' In his expostulation he dropped his cleaner hand, perhaps accidentally, perhaps not, upon the joker's heart. 
The joker wrapped it with his own, took a nimble spring upward, and came down in a fantastic dancing attitude, with one of his stained shoes jerked off his foot into his hand and held out. A joker of an extremely, not to say wolfishly practical character, he looked under those circumstances. "'Put it on, put it on,' said the other. "'Call wine, wine, and finish there.' With that advice he wiped his soiled hand upon the joker's dress, such as it was, quite deliberately, as having dirtied the hand on his account, and then recrossed the road and entered the wine-shop. The wine-shop-keeper was a bull-necked, martial-looking man of thirty, and he should have been of a hot temperament, for although it was a bitter day, he wore no coat, but carried one slung over his shoulder— his shirt-sleeves were rolled up, too, and his brown arms were bare to the elbows. Neither did he wear anything more on his head than his own crisply curling short dark hair. He was a dark man altogether, with good eyes and a good bold breadth between them. Good-humoured looking on the whole, but implacable looking, too. Evidently a man of strong resolution and a set purpose a man not desirable to be met rushing down a narrow pass with a gulf on either side, for nothing would turn the man. Madame Defarge, his wife, sat in the shop behind the counter as he came in. Madame Defarge was a stout woman of about his own age, with a watchful eye that seldom seemed to look at anything, a large hand, heavily ringed, a steady face, strong features, and great composure of manner. There was a character about Madame Defarge, from which one might have predicated that she did not often make mistakes against herself in any of the reckonings over which she presided. Madame Defarge, being sensitive to cold, was wrapped in fur, and had a quantity of bright shawl twined about her head, though not to the concealment of her large earrings. Her knitting was before her, but she had laid it down to pick her teeth with a toothpick. Thus engaged, with her right elbow supported by her left hand, Madame Defarge said nothing when her lord came in, but coughed just one grain of cough. This, in combination with the lifting of her darkly defined eyebrows over her toothpick by the breadth of a line, suggested to her husband that he would do well to look round the shop among the customers, for any new customer who had dropped in while he stepped over the way. The wine-shopkeeper accordingly rolled his eyes about until they rested upon an elderly gentleman and a young lady, who were seated in a corner. Other company were there, two playing cards, two playing dominoes, three standing by the counter, lengthening out a short supply of wine. As he passed behind the counter, he took notice that the elderly gentleman said in a look to the young lady, "'This is our man.' "'What the devil do you do in that gallery there?' said M. Defarge to himself. "'I don't know you.' But he feigned not to notice the two strangers, and fell into discourse with the triumvirate of customers who were drinking at the counter. "'How goes it, Jacques?' said one of these three to M. Defarge. "'Is all the spilt wine swallowed?' "'Every drop, Jacques,' answered M. Defarge. When this interchange of Christian names was effected, Madame Defarge, picking her teeth with her toothpick, coughed another grain of cough, and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. "'It is not often,' said the second of the three, addressing Monsieur Defarge, "'that many of these miserable beasts know the taste of wine, or of anything but black bread and death. Is it not so, Jacques?' "'It is so, Jacques,' Monsieur Defarge returned. At this second interchange of the Christian name— Madame Defarge, still using her toothpick with profound composure, coughed another grain of cough, and raised her eyebrows by the breadth of another line. The last of the three now said his say, as he put down his empty drinking-vessel, and smacked his lips. "'Ah, so much the worse! A bitter taste it is that such poor cattle always have in their mouths, and hard lives they live, Jacques. Am I right, Jacques?' "'You are right, Jacques.' was the response of Monsieur Defarge. The third interchange of the Christian name was completed at the moment when Madame Defarge put her toothpick by, kept her eyebrows up, and slightly rustled in her seat. "'Hold, then, true,' muttered her husband. "'Gentlemen, my wife.' The three customers pulled off their hats to Madame Defarge with three flourishes. 
She acknowledged their homage by bending her head and giving them a quick look. Then she glanced in a casual manner round the wine-shop, took up her knitting with great apparent calmness and repose of spirit, and became absorbed in it. "'Gentlemen,' said her husband, who had kept his bright eye observantly upon her, "'good day. The chamber, furnished bachelor fashion, that you wished to see and were inquiring for when I stepped out, is on the fifth floor. The doorway of the staircase gives on to the little courtyard close to the left here.' pointing with his hand, near to the window of my establishment. But now that I remember, one of you has already been there, and can show the way. Gentlemen, adieu. They paid for their wine, and left the place. The eyes of Monsieur Defarge were studying his wife at her knitting, when the elderly gentleman advanced from his corner, and begged the favour of a word. Willingly, sir, said Monsieur Defarge, and quietly stepped with him to the door. Their conference was very short, but very decided. Almost at the first word, M. Defarge started, and became deeply attentive. It had not lasted a minute, when he nodded and went out. The gentleman then beckoned to the young lady, and they too went out. Madame Defarge knitted with nimble fingers and steady eyebrows, and saw nothing. Mr. Jarvis Lorry and Miss Manette, emerging from the wine-shop thus, joined M. Defarge in the doorway to which he had directed his other company just before. It opened from a stinking little black courtyard, and was the general public entrance to a great pile of houses, inhabited by a great number of people. In the gloomy tile-paved entry to the gloomy tile-paved staircase, M. Defarge bent down on one knee to the child of his old master, and put her hand to his lips. It was a gentle action, but not at all gently done. A very remarkable transformation had come over him in a few seconds. He had no good humour in his face, nor any openness of aspect left, but had become a secret, angry, dangerous man. It is very high. It is a little difficult. Better to begin slowly. Thus M. Defarge, in a stern voice to Mr. Lorry, as they began ascending the stairs. "'Is he alone?' the latter whispered. "'Alone! God help him who should be with him!' said the other, in the same low voice. "'Is he always alone, then?' "'Yes.' "'Of his own desire?' "'Of his own necessity. As he was when I first saw him after they found me, and demanded to know if I would take him, and that my peril be discreet. As he was then, so he is now.' "'He is greatly changed?' "'Changed!' The keeper of the wine-shop stopped to strike the wall with his hand, and mutter a tremendous curse. No direct answer could have been half so forcible. Mr. Lorry's spirits grew heavier and heavier, as he and his two companions ascended higher and higher. Such a staircase, with its accessories, in the older and more crowded parts of Paris, would be bad enough now but at that time it was vile indeed to unaccustomed and unhardened senses. Every little habitation within the great foul nest of one high building, that is to say the room or rooms within every door that opened on the general staircase, left its own heap of refuse on its own landing, besides flinging other refuse from its own windows. The uncontrollable and hopeless mass of decomposition so engendered would have polluted the air, even if poverty and deprivation had not loaded it with their intangible impurities, the two bad sources combined to make it almost insupportable. Through such an atmosphere, by a steep dark shaft of dirt and poison, the way lay. Yielding to his own disturbance of mind, and to his young companion's agitation, which became greater every instant, Mr. Jarvis Lorry twice stopped the rest, each of these stoppages was made at a doleful grating, by which any languishing good airs that were left uncorrupted seemed to escape, and all spoilt and sickly vapours seemed to crawl in. Through the rusted bars, tastes rather than glimpses were caught of the jumbled neighbourhood, and nothing within range, nearer or lower than the summits of the two great towers of Notre Dame, had any promise on it of healthy life or wholesome aspirations. At last the top of the staircase was gained, and they stopped for the third time. 
there was yet an upper staircase of a steeper inclination and of contracted dimensions to be ascended before the garret story was reached. The keeper of the wine-shop, always going a little in advance, and always going on the side which Mr. Lorry took, as though he dreaded to be asked any question by the young lady, turned himself about here, and carefully feeling in the pockets of the coat he carried over his shoulder, took out a key. "'The door is locked, then, my friend?' said Mr. Lorry, surprised. "'Eh, hey, yes,' was the grim reply of M. Defarge. "'You think it necessary to keep the unfortunate gentleman so retired?' "'I think it necessary to turn the key.' M. Defarge whispered it closer in his ear, and frowned heavily. "'Why? Why? Because he has lived so long locked up that he would be frightened, rave, tear himself to pieces, die, come to I know not what harm if his door was left open?' "'Is it possible?' exclaimed Mr. Lorry. "'Is it possible?' repeated Defarge bitterly. "'Yes, and a beautiful world we live in when it is possible, and when many other such things are possible, and not only possible but done, done, see you, under that sky there every day. Long live the devil. Let us go on.' This dialogue had been held in so very low a whisper that not a word of it had reached the young lady's ears. But by this time she trembled under such strong emotion, and her face expressed such deep anxiety, and above all such dread and terror, that Mr. Lorry felt it incumbent on him to speak a word or two of reassurance. "'Courage, dear miss, courage! Business! The worst will be over in a moment. It is but passing the room-door, and the worst is over. Then all the good you bring to him, all the relief, all the happiness you bring to him, begin.' Let our good friend here assist you on that side. That's well, friend Defarge. Come now, business, business. They went up, slowly and softly. The staircase was short, and they were soon at the top. There, as it had an abrupt turn in it, they came all at once in sight of three men, whose heads were bent down close together at the side of a door, and who were intently peering into the room to which the door belonged, through some chinks or holes in the wall. On hearing footsteps close at hand, these three turned and rose, and showed themselves to be the three of one name who had been drinking in the wine-shop. "'I forgot them in the surprise of your visit,' explained M. Defarge. "'Leave us, good boys. We have business here.' The three glided by, and went silently down. There appearing to be no other door on that floor, and the keeper of the wine-shop going straight to this one when they were left alone— Mr. Lorry asked him in a whisper, with a little anger, "'Do you make a show of Monsieur Manette?' "'I show him in the way you have seen to a chosen few.' "'Is that well? I think it is well. "'Who are the few? How do you choose them?' "'I choose them as real men, of my name. Jacques is my name, to whom the sight is likely to do good. Enough. You're English. That is another thing.' "'Stay there, if you please, a little moment.' With an admonitory gesture to keep them back, he stooped and looked in through the crevice in the wall. Soon raising his head again, he struck twice or thrice upon the door, evidently with no other object than to make a noise there. With the same intention, he drew the key across it three or four times, before he put it clumsily into the lock, and turned it as heavily as he could. The door slowly opened inward under his hand, and he looked into the room and said something. A faint voice answered something. Little more than a single syllable could have been spoken on either side. He looked back over his shoulder and beckoned them to enter. Mr. Lorry got his arm securely round the daughter's waist and held her, for he felt that she was sinking. "'Ah! Ah! Business!' Business, he urged, with a moisture that was not of business, shining upon his cheek. Come in, come in. I am afraid of it, she answered, shuddering. Of it? What? I mean of him, of my father. Rendered in a manner desperate by her state, and by the beckoning of their conductor, he drew over his neck the arm that shook upon his shoulder, lifted her a little, and hurried her into the room. He set her down just within the door, and held her, clinging to him. 
Defarge drew out the key, closed the door, locked it on the inside, took out the key again, and held it in his hand. All this he did methodically, and with as loud and harsh an accompaniment of noise as he could make. Finally he walked across the room with a measured tread to where the window was. He stopped there and faced round. The garret, built to be a depository for firewood and the like, was dim and dark, for the window of dormer shape was in truth a door in the roof, with a little crane over it, for the hoisting up of stores from the street, unglazed and closing up the middle in two pieces like any other door of French construction. To exclude the cold, one half of this door was fast closed, and the other was opened but a very little way. Such a scanty portion of light was admitted through these means, that it was difficult on first coming in to see anything, and long habit alone could have slowly formed in any one the ability to do any work requiring nicety in such obscurity. Yet work of that kind was being done in the garret, for with his back to the door, and his face towards the window, where the keeper of the wine-shop stood looking at him, a white-haired man sat on a low bench, stooping forward, and very busy making shoes. End of Book One, Chapter Five